Now the mic is on, so now you can hear me. So welcome all, and we'll start off with music by Rick Fairbrook. I'm not singing today, but I will. <laughs> Thank you very much. I, that's what I expected. Thank you. Uh, I am going to uh, read an introduction for our music today on the screen, um, and it goes like this. When a snowstorm prevented the person scheduled to sing the national anthem at a tournament basketball game, someone in the crowd suggested one person who was, who was in attendance, Carlton Smith, as having a good voice, and so at the last minute he was asked to stand in for the scheduled performer. Carlton, Carlton Smith happened to be a local police officer who in this case, save the day, delivering an impromptu rendition of the national anthem. At a later game, the singer who couldn't make it and the last minute stand in were united to perform a beautiful duet of the Star Spangled Banner, which you are about to hear. On January 12th against Kansas, weather conditions prevented singer Leslie Dorchester from making it to the Coliseum to perform the national anthem. Thankfully, WBU police officer Carlton Smith was working that night and able to step in on a moment's notice to help out. Today, they're here for a special performance together. We ask that you please rise for the singing of our national anthem by Leslie Dorchester and Officer Carlton Smith. to start. David Links, our invocation. Thank you, President John. Today I wanted to share uh, some thoughts from author Louise Hay, whose famous quote goes through my head all the time, that the universe loves grateful people. The key to a happy, healthy, successful life is gratitude. It uplifts us and sustains us and draws us to what we want. When we focus on what we want with gratitude, we draw it to us. We become a magnet for our own good. When we give gratitude to life, life give, gives back to us. When we feel grateful, people, as well as the abundance of the universe, are drawn to us. If you have money problems and you find a penny, feel gratitude with great intensity, and you will draw more money to you. When you give thanks for the situation and, and events in our life that are challenging, Knowing that we are being blessed with this wisdom from this experience, the very act of gratitude transforms the negative experience into a positive one. When we express gratitude, we draw to us people and situations to be grateful for. This is the magic of gratitude. Thank you. Thank you. You can please be seated. I can't tell you how wonderful it is to see you all here in, a, in the room and see the room begin to fill up again. It's, uh, this is a great, uh, great way to begin this year and this year for me. 
Um, we have a lot of guests today, and uh, just uh, I'd like you have a guest at your table. Just kind of raise your hand, and let's welcome them all to to our meeting today. Yay! <laughs> Remember, a lot of those guests are potential members, so you can, uh, there, there's a form you fill out on your way out if you're a guest, so. A um, uh, thing that no president or no one up at this kind of place likes to talk about is um, losses in our club. Um, and I think we've, we all know very well, and just to remind you that um, the celebration of life for Bill Wheeler will be this coming Sunday at one o'clock at the Country Club. Um, Bill was our president in 2000, 2001 and passed away from COVID compli complications right at the end of last year. So um, I hope a lot of you would like to attend to that. He was a great person and a great asset to this club and this community. Um, the other piece of sad news, which you may or may not know, is that our longtime member, um, Jim Fitch's wife, Sally, uh, passed away a week ago. Um, I do not have any details yet on any kind of memorial or whatnot, but uh, she unfortunately suffered um, a massive stroke and passed away uh, about a week later. So she unfortunately is another one that we have lost. But on more happy notes, we have a picnic coming up in just about a month. And to talk about that will be Mr. Mike Hummel. Thank you, John. Uh, August the 19th. 5 to 7 p.m. at Franklin Park is going to be our Rotary Picnic. We get to do it again this year. Looking forward to seeing everybody there. Uh, going to have lots of fun. Make sure to bring the kiddos. Look on your uh, desk, please, or on the tables. There are sign-up sheets. Carolyn, we talked about maybe sending out an email. Is that? Yep. We'll give you getting an email out so you can sign up there as well if you're not able to today. Uh, going to have a dunk tank, which we're really looking forward to. Uh, some pinatas for the kids. All kinds of good stuff going on. So it should be a lot of fun. So please make sure and sign up and let me know if any questions. If you're part of the social committee, uh, I'll be sending out some emails, but uh, please plan to be there at least an hour early just to help us set things up, and then please plan to stick around about a half hour late to help us clean things up. So again, five to seven is the time frame. Hour early if you're on the, on the club or in the committee. Other than that, thank you very much. Promises to be a great time and a great time for all our families to get together after such a long, long spell at home. Um, one of the great things that this club gets to do over the years and has done over the years is to recognize people who are either Rotarians or non-Rotarians who have done great things in the community. And as the first uh, award for this year, or first person to be recognized, we have Mr. Bob Romero, who is going to present a special award. Thank you, President John. Um, Yakima Rotary's Unsung Hero Award honors outstanding community volunteers who embrace the Rotary motto of service above self. And honorees cannot be part of this or any other Rotary Club, and their actions cannot be part of their vocational pursuits. And while I was not on the committee that made this selection, I think it's a wonderful choice, and it's my honor and privilege to present this award. We certainly recognize the face of this building, <clears throat> and even if you don't know a key face that's behind it, and I'm not talking about standing behind it in the park, nor am I talking about the people that, there we go, that uh, you see here. Uh, this is about a person that uh, is someone who embraced a vision and invested thousands of hours and dollars with the goal of one day seeing an image like this. And by the time the groundbreaking occurred, this guy had work, already worked for years without fanfare as the lead volunteer. Negotiations, contracts, presentations to funders, he was all in all the time. When rib ribbon cutting arrived, he had invested countless hours over seven years leading the YMCA Futures Advisory Group and its various subcommittees and volunteers in all facets of facility planning, development, and construction. At that point, he even had the wisdom to transfer responsibility for monitoring me back to my wife. <laughs> the reality is, if not for this man, there would not be a YMCA and Yakima Rotary Aquatic Center. <clears throat> and that is why today we honor a most deserving unsung hero, Mark Smith.
I do have a few more minutes, Mark, so that I'm, I'm not going to yield back the balance of the time just yet. Uh, Mark brought an amazing skill set and qualities to a very demanding project, and I don't know that there is anybody else that could have done all the things that he did. And all of this while he simultaneously served the community in other ways as well. Mark's priorities in life are family, faith, friends, service, and his commercial real estate business, plus those hunting trips that he likes to take. His priorities don't change. He just has to juggle from time to time how much time he has available to commit to each of those things, and he does it well. Somehow, Mark carves out special time for each of his family members. He's blessed to have a supportive, beautiful, and incredibly capable wife and Cherie as his partner and collaborator, and we'll great, we are very grateful for her willingness to make Mark available. Thanks to Mark's leadership, a concept that began during Ollie Nelson's tenure as a Y.C. CEO in the 1980s was able to be realized about 30 years later. There were many obstacles and challenges. He had to work with this dude. Uh, there were politics, processes, timing, resources, all of those things, and there were some who tried to derail this project. Mark's intelligence, determination, and problem-solving skills were key factors in moving ahead. He often asked, in addition to praying, what do we need to do to keep this thing moving forward? At times, we were like Holmes and Watson, Kirk and Spock, Batman and Robin, minus the tights and cool car. Uh, at other times, we were probably a little bit more like Homer and Bart, and possibly if we had had the eyebrows, Bert and Ernie. But um, nonetheless, uh, our prayers were answered, obstacles overcome, and our efforts were rewarded. Mark even pulled in his YMCA youth swim coach to, as a consultant during this time. Uh, you might even recognize that guy as well. But this wasn't the only thing that Mark had on his plate while all of this was happening. During this project, he served a lead role in coordinating a Boy Scout encampment for nearly 3,000 kids. Multiple times, he and Cherie led young people on pioneer treks simulating the days of Old West migrations. And in the midst of the Y project, he was called to be a bishop in his church, which effectively was adding a second full-time job for him. The constant in all of this is Mark's energy, commitment, and passion to serve youth and families. People who know him well use these words to describe Mark. Caring, compassionate, wise, committed, kind, selfless, brilliant, charitable, resilient, honest, forthright, a problem solver, highly skilled, a man with a true servant heart. And a word that was repeated over and over was humble. Working on the Y Project, Mark would often say, my satisfaction will come the day that I can see kids and families in that pool smiling. That was all the reward that he said he needed. And he certainly invested an awful lot for that reward. Ladies and gentlemen, as he makes his way to the podium to receive this award, please join me in saluting a man that I deeply respect, admire, and love, Yakima Rotary's unsung hero, Mark Smith. Uh, this plaque reads, Mark Smith, July 15, 2021, for his skilled, humble service to youth and families in the Yakima Valley, from leading the development of the new YMCA and Yakima Rotary Aquatic Center to serving faithfully in his church, Mark impacts lives. Mark Smith, you exemplify the Rotary motto of service above self. On behalf of Rotary and the community, thank you. I'd just like to say one thing. It's nice to thank you very much for the, uh, the honor and the privilege of receiving this award, but let's be honest, we know who did the work. I may be getting the, the accolades at this moment, but this is the man who did everything out there. So thank you, Bob. <clears throat> when I had, I had the privilege of doing the first award, and now uh, I will pass the baton to Rick Pinnell, who uh, is, also has a presentation. Rick.
Two years ago, the Rotary First Citizen Committee uh, picked an honoree for the First Citizen. Uh, due to the conflicts in COVID, it's been two years, and we finally today are going to get to honor that nominee. The Rotary First Citizen uh, Award is to honor a senior Rotarian who has given his lifetime to our community to let our, particularly our young members know and be aware of the role model that are in this club. It's my honor today to honor our first citizen award to Jim Smith. <laughs> You don't have to speak, Jim. You just can sit and we're going to let me tell, take the rest. <laughs> you know, <clears throat> for those of you who know Jim and Mark, um, these aren't two people who like a lot of the public accolades. Um, they, don't out, they don't seek out public recognition. But as I think about Jim and Mark, we have to have them recognized publicly because they are the teachers and role models for all of us to learn from. And that's the reason that we want to recognize them. And I know that they may not like that, but that's what we have to do. We learn from these kind of people, and uh, I appreciate both of them. And yes, uh, I guess it's not a secret, uh, Mark is Jim's son. <laughs> Jim is a leader among leaders. <clears throat> For our young, younger members, pay attention. This honoree and how he has led and why he has made so many of our valley organizations better due to his leadership. He is a role model for being a volunteer board member. As Rotary president in 1997, Jim is the one that worked with the convention center so we can meet here on a regular basis. He's the one who put a clock up here. You might think about that, John. I don't see the <laughs> clock. <laughs> it was a pretty good idea, John. <laughs> Uh, on the podium to hold people accountable. He was a president who appointed Carolyn as our executive secretary. <laughs> In fairness to Ken Marble, he's the one that hired Carolyn to be the assistant executive secretary, but Jim's the one that put her in that position. So all of you Rotarian presidents that have been bragging about that for years, that's the story from Carolyn. Jim was the first Rotary auction chair. Jim was on the first Rotary board of six, Rotary Trust Board of six members. He was 100% involved in the very bad portion of Yakima to what you see today at the Yakima Gateway Sports Complex. He was instrumental in how we were able to buy the property in that area for a price that was fair to all homeowners. He helped with our government issues, the personnel who helped us, and the list goes on and on. We knew the sports complex would change that area of town. What you see today, see today far exceeded our expectations of what has happened. A sports complex, a park, new housing developments surrounding the area. It all started with the first Rotary Trust of six members and $250, $250,000. Jim was chairman of Heritage University's board from 2002 to 2006. He was active not only in the, as a board chair, but also active in helping recruit some of the best vice presidents at Heritage University. His leadership was vital at that time of infancy at Heritage. He was president of United Way, and he led the United Way fund drive, and he was successful in reaching the goal. What I would like to get all of you to understand Jim's honor is how to be a board member and leader. You do not need to be the leader to be a leader. Jim's behind the scenes work was instrumental in many, many organizations in our community. Today, if an organization was looking for a board president or a board member, Jim Smith would, should be one of their top choices. He treats people with respect and holds them accountable. Jim's first criteria to volunteer for an organization is passion for the mission. 
without passion for the mission, he says, why would you join that organization? He's not afraid to make changes that make an organization better, even at times when it could be painful. He follows the mission as a compass for an organization's success. This includes holding staff accountable for that mission's success. He firmly believes if you are on a board, you are there to make a difference and improve the organization. Be involved and express your opinion. Jim always leaves an organization better than when he arrived. Jim has been a pilot his whole life and finally decided it was time to quit flying at 80. He's active, and I mean active, in fishing, hunting, skiing, hiking, boating, and the list goes on and on. To do any activity is kind of like doing something with a 10-year-old kid. Let's take skiing for example. He wants to be the first one on the chair. He skis with great abandon, and then he skis too long in the day. Now, Jim has suffered um, painful con consequences from his youthful exuberance, and that at times his more mature body has paid a serious price. Broken bones, pulled muscles, and pain, this is all because Jim does not do anything halfway. At 65, Jim converted to the LDS church. Many thought he was dying. Why would he do such a thing? He had it all. Why would he join a church? <laughs> Why would he join a church? Well, Jim knew he did not have it all. And typical Jim was not afraid of making a change to make his life fuller. A leader among leaders. There's no one I know who lives every day 100% as if it was his last day. It's my honor to, to recognize my friend and our first citizen award, Jim Smith. And I'm going to come down to you, Jim. What a great way to start this year with our awards, and what great deserving people. So uh, now with Sergeant at Arms, Sherry, who didn't get a chance last week. So that just means that all the fines this week, you should think about doing it twice. Double. Double. Sherry. All right. Yes, last week I was preempted. So this week, fines are double. Um, and we're going to get started. So show of hands. How many think newly elected President John will look like this after leading all of us for an entire year? Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. OK. So basically, I think we all need to pay a dollar because he has to lead all of us. It's not him that I'm worried about. It's us that I worry about. He has to lead us. So everybody needs to pay a dollar. And in all seriousness, that picture was taken at the playground. He was a really good sport because I did a little selfie with him and I. You noticed I cut myself out because it was not a pretty picture. So I appreciated him for being, <laughs> he was being a good sport. And now I just used it against him. So that's rude. I know. OK. So um, next question. Um, Jan Luring's table. Y'all, you have five seconds to answer this question. What is President John's theme for this year? One, two, three, four, five, and what was that? Wrong. I didn't hear it, it was wrong. Okay, a little late, a little late. So y'all still need to pay a dollar. But it is, it's uh, a brand new day. Um, so when I was thinking about this theme, A Brand New Day, I realized, you know, there's a lot of brand new day songs. There's a lot of them. 
and you might not know that, but I was just thinking we could take this brand new day thing to a whole new level. Like it could be Yakima Downtown Rotary Musical like at least twice a month with a different song all the time. I mean, Charlie and Al could be practicing for days, hours. So I just wanted to see if you all know some of the other brand new day songs. So, waiting for, there we go. Okay, so, oh, I need to pick a table. Uh, how about past president Jennifer Bleasner's table? Y'all ready? You are going to listen to this five second brand new day song clip and you'll have five seconds to name the artist. Answer. <gasps> that was Sting. So that album was released in September of 1999. And so they got it right, so everyone else has to pay a dollar. You knew that was coming. Like, Okay, next one. Um, Jordan Matson's table. You were waving, so hi. Uh, you're gonna listen to this um, brand new song, five second clip, five seconds, same, same routine. Hit it. That'll stick with you. One, two, three, four, five. Uh, Definitely have to pay a dollar. Everyone should pay a dollar for that answer. That was Demi Lovato. That brand new day song was from Disney's Camp Rock 2, the final jam movie. That was released in 2010. Okay. Um, my, who's my next victim? I mean participant. Sunny Cameron's table. You will listen, same, same routine. You're gonna listen to this brand new day song, five second clip, five seconds, hit it. One, two, three, four, five. Answer, please. <laughs> Kenny Chesney, wrong answer. You will pay a dollar. It's a good guess. It is Eddie Money. And that album was released in April of 2020 after his death in September of 2019. Okay, last one. I have to pick a very specific table for this. Harry Hellison's table. It's a perfect table for this one. Are y'all ready? Guys, are you ready? Gotta focus. Okay, five second song clip. You got five seconds. Hit it, Carolyn. Maybe one more time, because Harry, maybe one more time. Harry's got this. Answer, five seconds. Oh! You got nothing? Okay. That was The Count, Elmo, and Abby from Sesame Street. So y'all need to pay a dollar, and if you have never watched Sesame Street, you need, you need to pay two dollars. And I want to hear Charlie and Al sing that song, because that song will stick with you for the rest of the day, so you're welcome for that. Thank you very much. We love brand new days. And here to introduce an extremely special speaker is Casey Corr. Hello, everybody. Uh, when I joined this year's program committee, the first person I thought of was our next sp speaker, Carmen Best. Chief Best is one of the most honored law enforcement of officers in America, nationally recognized for her leadership and thoughtfulness. 
I first got to know Carmen when she was a sergeant in the Seattle Police Department, assigned to public relations and working with knuckleheads like me in the Seattle Mayor's office. From the start, I admired and liked her. She is tough, smart, good-humored, and guided by the values and professionalism we want and need in police officers. It did not surprise me to see Carmen earn a string of promotions, and in 2018, she became chief, managing 2,000 civilians and sworn officers. Carmen Best became chief in Seattle during one of that city's and our nation's most difficult times. The trauma caused by the COVID pandemic and the painful and often overdue and overdue reassessment of policing in America ignited in, the part, in part by the murder of George Floyd. Seattle gained national attention for its protests, especially rioting in the city's downtown and the occupation of a portion of Capitol Hill known as CHOP. Calls for defunding of police led the Seattle City Council to propose extreme sudden cuts to the police department budget, which ultimately, ultimately led Chief Best to decide to resign. Seattle lost a great chief, but our nation gained a voice, a person who plays an important role as all of us sort through the proper role of police in our community. How do we achieve a more just and fair society? What is the role of police in that goal? What standards should be set for police conduct? Chief Best is someone we want leading these conversations. We are so lucky to have her with us today. Please join me in welcoming Chief Carmen Best. Wow, thank you so much. I hope you can all hear me okay. Give me a thumbs up if you're on. Perfect, thank you, wonderful. So good afternoon. I am so incredibly excited to join uh, your Rotary group today um, and just to meet with you. Um, I wanna especially thank Casey Core for reaching out to me and inviting me to be here. As he said, we've known each other for many, many years and he was really a consummate professional, uh, a man of high integrity who I really enjoyed working with uh, and getting to know. So it was my pleasure uh, to come here and chat with you this afternoon. First and foremost, before I um, think of myself as a police officer, which I was in the career for 30 years, I think of myself as a mom, a mom of two amazing young women. Uh, my two girls played basketball. They were both really good at it. And anyone who knows anything about team sports or anything about sports at this level knows that it's not always the team with the best talent that wins the game. They have to be able to make decisions from the same playbook. And they have to be able to think about how they're going to work together. And I think of this as a situation of, of situational leadership. You have your principles, you know, your core, but you can't be so rigid that you can't adjust to the situation or the job or the team that you have to work with. It sounds like common sense, uh, but in practice, uh, you know, leadership is a skill, especially under situational leadership. You can develop it, you can practice it, you can make it almost reflexive, but you're gonna to have to tune it up and you're gonna to need to rely on it in every situation. When I formally got the chief's job, I was determined to implement the lessons that I learned throughout my career. And now a lesson that I learned, and maybe not quickly enough, but I did learn it, is that when you're building a team, it is not as easy as just finding the people with the right skills and experiences and diversity that you're looking for. You really have to work to get the right people in the right position, or more, sim more simply put, um, round pegs and round holes. And if you're lucky, you have the time for your team to gel and work together so that they can practice these skills. Now, in policing, if you're lucky, this means maybe getting a couple of weeks for the team to practice working together before something major hits and before there's a true crisis, which will come. So in January of 2020, which seems so long ago, although it wasn't that long ago, just a year and a half ago at this point, but it does seem like it was a 
completely different time. Uh, in Seattle, we had the worst mass shooting in our history in downtown. And I'll tell you, I have to say that that day, I think the team performed admirably uh, considering the circumstances. Earlier in the day, we'd had an officer involved shooting almost in the same area where a drug, uh, a drug by bus had uh, gone south, so to speak, uh, and ended up with the officer involved shooting. And we were on our way back to headquarters, uh, almost to the building from that, uh, from that shooting when we got a call of another shooting uh, in downtown Seattle. And so shots fired, you know, we turned around, I was headed back downtown to Third and Pine and Third and Pike uh, to the area, got on scene, you know, did what the chief normally does, checking on my staff and the people, updating the mayor, talking to our federal partners, uh, but the team was really doing the work. They were the ones that were pulling the video, they were taking care of backfilling patrols so the calls got answered and they were doing what they were supposed to do. So after this, we designed a response plan to prevent more violence in the area. And I was feeling pretty good about where we were going. We had learned a lot and we were performing well. Then about a month later, COVID hit. And I don't have to explain to anyone how serious and unprecedented the nature of this pandemic was. And we were working literally 18 hour days, the whole team for weeks. And it was exhausting, um, but it really brought us together and gave us a chance to really exercise our, our leadership muscle and figure out what we were doing. Uh, because as you know, the, it started in Kirkland, just outside of Seattle. And uh, we were the first major law enforcement agency to have to address many of the issues around the pandemic. There was no footprint, there was no blueprint, there was no roadmap uh, on how to get things done. And so we really were working on how do we get personal protective equipment? Well, how do we sanitize areas? What's the safe distancing? What is the CDC saying? And what is the World Health Organization saying? It was really uh, unprecedented times and there was a lot of concern about it, but we came together, we worked hard. We developed the first uh, first responder test site in the nation to get um, uh, first responders tested quickly, working with our fire department so that we could get them back in the field because they were essential workers. So we worked through all of that, worked out well, uh, it made some real um, game-changing uh, uh, innovations. And then as we were you know, getting settled into how we were going to respond to COVID-19, uh, came uh, the murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis. Now, when I came into policing and onto the police department, it was right during the fallout of the Rodney King uh, situation in, um, in Los Angeles. And I had been deputy chief in the aftermath of the Ferguson riots. And so you all know, and as most people know, Seattle knows how to protest. So we fully expected that we were gonna have uh, several protests um, regarding this. And I'll, I'll just pause for a second to say that, you know, many of us, uh, you know, were disgusted by what we saw. And I think that uh, I was one of the earlier chiefs to speak out against it. And I truly meant it. And I knew that our department felt that and our community needed to hear that. So uh, I will not do a play-by-play -play of those events that started on May 29th, uh, when we in essence had a pop-up protest where almost everyone was intent on destruction. I was literally sitting at my desk uh, on that night when I saw about 150 people dressed in black, you know, riding uh, their bikes um, northbound on Fifth Avenue against traffic. And we really had to quickly respond uh, and uh, deal with that. The next day, uh, over 10,000 people showed up into downtown. And um, most of them were peaceful. And it, were, it was a primarily um, peaceful crowd. But there were people embedded in that crowd that were intent on destruction and violence. And all of our training, nationally renowned training, none of it was created to deal with this situation because we really hadn't faced anything like it before. And really, no one in the US had really faced um, that level of um, intense dis, um, uh, protest and demonstration that was you know, built in, in it was this uh, level of violence that came along with it. And it was vastly different uh, situation for us. Uh, my first couple of years as chief, I was concerned at, with the consent decree and working with the people in the department and working with the community, focusing on crime. But on this situation, every day was being influenced by politics. And this went on for weeks, night 
after night after night. And we tried many different approaches um, you know, to kind of address what we were dealing with there. And then we had what became the Capitol Hill Autonomous Zone, which then morphed into the Capitol Hill Organized Protest. And even during all of that, while people were occupying the neighborhood, the demonstrations and the protests were still going on. And it's in these situations, I'll tell you, when leadership can truly be lonely. When you are charged with ensuring public safety in a jurisdiction, you have to have a commitment to enforcing the law and to upholding the constitution. And you can't make decisions based on what will you know, play well um, with the media, with others. And I think we would be better off, all of us, uh, we'd be better served if everyone uh, made decisions um, outside of that realm. But that isn't always the reality. But um, leading by doing what you know is right can leave you feeling uh, in some ways like you're strapped to the mast in the middle of a storm. And, you know, and to be clear, you know, my team had my back. We came together, we worked tirelessly like we did during COVID. But what I'm talking about is no one else was standing up and saying, what is happening here? Can people come in and take part of a neighborhood, destroy property, attack officers? It isn't right. Right, but that's the job of a leader. You have to be able to stand up. Um, and I had to you know, keep the department going after we had been engaged in weeks of taking rocks and bottles. You know, I had to say, this isn't okay. You know, and I've marched in protests. My children and my family have marched in protest, but this was not that. This was something much different. And I really can't speak to why people couldn't or wouldn't say that. Of course, throughout, I made it very clear uh, that I knew we would learn from mistakes. Not everything was perfect. Um, I, didn't, I didn't think that, but I clearly knew the difference between what was legal, what was ethical and what was moral and what was not. And I was looking back across my uh, almost uh, 30 years on the department. It was amazing how much I had learned in those first days on patrol that came into play in those last few months. You know, but I also had to be flexible and I had to keep adapting. And I think I did the most adapting in those last six months. I had never had to lead in so many different ways, almost day to day. Uh, you can only be ready for that if you've practiced it. So here we are now. Uh, I know you've all heard the buzzwords, defund, divest, reimagine, reinvent, abolish. Everyone has their own definition and their own understanding. Where I hope rational, thoughtful minds end up is this. We have new tools and options. The government needs to be available, and to have available that is, to meet the needs of the community. It is a little unorthodox to say it because I think it goes against how uh, policing has been framed for many years, but police officers have always in part, you know, had some work in social work. Um, it's not why we signed up, and that's not what most of our training is focused on, but we have been because of our societal issues involved in that. And simply because other places, you know, weren't always able to show up. Um, that isn't to cast dispersions on social service agencies. You know, our country hasn't correctly addressed that need really ever, um, but especially since deinstitutionalizing uh, was uh, in effect in the 70s. Then we, and I mean the royal we by that, all promised to build a comprehensive community-based mental health service system in the face of horrible conditions and institutionalized care. Well, you know, how did that go, right? Uh, take a look around. We can see the system was barely built if it was built at all. So my worry is we are in the midst of doing the same thing. Major cities across the countries have lost historic numbers of officers. Gun violence and homicides are up at recent historic levels. And it has become a challenge in some situations to have accountability for even the most violent of offenders. Uh, we are on a path of deconstructing the criminal justice system without building its replacement first. And I'm here to tell you folks, you just can't do that. We know that it doesn't work. So I really think that, you know, as a member of multiple organizations that support the idea 
of you know, collaboration and working together, we really have to bring our resources together so that we have a comprehensive plan so that before someone calls 911, um, that, you know, what, what I'm saying here is by the time someone calls 911, the problem is already there. We have to have systems upstream that they can do the work so that the calls don't have to be made and those calls for service can be uh, limited or mitigated. And I think now is an incredibly exciting time to be in policing and you can bet uh, we will be back, you know, in the city and I'll be back doing uh, work in this policing. Um, but right now I'm enjoying um, staying, you know, in the conversation and having the opportunity to spend time with groups like you to hear what the broader community has to say. But I will say that we have to come together with a plan. And in Seattle in particular, where my, where my history was, I really think that um, the idea of moving forward, of reimagining, of doing things differently is important, of being innovative and policing, that's important, uh, finding ways that we can eliminate some of the racist practices that we all know have existed over time. All of it is incredibly important, but we have to be able to do it with a plan. We have to be able to move forward in a way that's comprehensive and thoughtful. We have to have national standards so that we don't, our geography doesn't define the level of um, policing that we get. And we have to stay true to the morals and ethics and values um, that our society holds before us. And we have to have a high level of accountability. And I believe if those things, if we move forward on those things, you know, we'll find that we have so much more in common as a society uh, and so many more goals that we all believe in. Um, but the divisiveness uh, and the polarization doesn't help us. And so I've learned those things. I continue to work very closely um, with lots of organizations and, and in my current role um, so that I can really be an advocate for public safety uh, across the board. And with that, I know I'm on a timeline here, but with that, I'd love to, if anybody has questions, um, take questions, and maybe I'll turn it back over to Casey uh, to provide that and um, have a little bit of a dialogue here. Uh, uh, I think the way we're going to work this is um, if you're on Zoom, uh, one of the things you need to do is put your questions in chat and uh, Carolyn will relay them. If you're here in the room, you need to come forward to the microphone, and uh, which is here in the center of the room, and um, ask your question. So with that, um, if anyone would like to come forward or in chat, one or the other, that was an incredibly powerful speech, and I think we really... Um, kind of encapsulated a lot of the issues we've been talking about. So I'd love to see what else, and I know that uh, Chief Best would like to also hear what you have to say as well. So. <clears throat> Good afternoon. One of the things I always wanted to know during this upheaval, we've spent a couple of hundred years developing law enforcement and new laws to protect the public. But during this transition period of rediscovery and all this upset, would you want your daughter to go into law enforcement or people that are, are inclined to go into law enforcement? No, I, I've been asked that question before and I actually did encourage my daughters to, uh, to go in law enforcement, but they said, mom, you work too hard. <laughs> I can work at Amazon and then work a lot less. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I think it's a really honorable profession. I still think it's an honorable profession. Even as we're going through transition, it, this is the time where it's really important that we make sure that we retain and recruit the best and the brightest people to move, um, to move the uh, profession forward uh, in a way that's collaborative and works with the community. So I certainly encourage people uh, to come into the profession and not discourage them at all. Well, that's good. Um, with, with this in mind, though, you have uh, like a double-edged sword in that mental health is a big problem. And people in law enforcement, I had some experience in law enforcement, and some people, when you go to a call and it's mental health issues, we're not equipped to do it, and usually there's no one available to help you along. Uh, I, don't you think that the mental health aspect needs more concentration in the future? 
Yeah, I certainly mentioned that about the institutions. I mean, we definitely need to work on our mental health crisis. In Seattle, um, when I left, there were about 18,000 calls, uh, crisis calls. These are bona fide calls a year where people are in a legitimate crisis and need assistance. And our systems just really haven't been built to address uh, the, you know, the, the crisis calls and the mental health aspects that uh, we're dealing with every single day. So many people, it affects so many things um, that we're dealing with in law enforcement. Certainly the number of unsheltered and unhoused people, a lot of them have mental health issues, a lot of domestic violence and other problems come from mental health issues. So we absolutely need a more comprehensive system. And what we find is that uh, police officers are often um, filling in the gap for other systems that um, haven't, uh, uh, you know, actually come through the way that we need them to, to help us. So I would certainly agree that we need to bolster those systems and that it would help us immensely as a society. So because often what we find is officers are the ones that answer the call when it comes in at two o'clock in the morning uh, when somebody's in crisis. So we're the ones that um, are there. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. <clears throat> you have another question coming here or Jane got there first. <laughs> I did. I don't have a question. Um, I just want to thank you um, for the service that you've done for Seattle and overall for um, our police officers. My oldest son is a police officer now, CSI, in Houston, Harris County, and you only reflect what they're all saying. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you for your comment. <laughs> Uh, Chief, thank you so much for uh, uh, for speaking to us today. My question is um, uh, somewhat open-ended. Um, I'm wondering what were the forces, I guess, that, that were uh, uh, most prominent in your mind that caused you to, to make the decision or, or to, uh, uh, I guess, reach the decision that you needed to resign from the position? Yeah, I've talked about that before. You know, honestly, it had been like I like I said, a really interesting and tumultuous year to say the least. Um, but I was really committed to the force and wanted to to wanted to stay. But you know, the the tension uh, between myself and some of the electeds was you know working against the the officers and the ability to really provide the level of service that we needed to. Uh, and in fact, we had worked really hard to recruit. Um, more people, uh, you know, a much more diverse department, more women. We spent, uh, we had a budget of about $1.6 million that was granted to us in December of 2019. And by the summer of 2020, uh, we were hearing we want to defund the, the police department and cut the resources in half. And, you know, honestly, uh, I had decided, you know, much earlier than when I resigned, but I did know that um, I couldn't continue to run an agency that one, where we uh, defunded by half the number of people that we had staffing us. We already were running with limited resources. And while I was really willing to engage in a conversation about how we might do things differently, um, I just did not hear a plan. Actually, I'm still waiting to see the plan. What's the plan for um, how you're going to deal with calls for service and with the increase in crime and, and with the mental health and with the unsheltered? And um, you know, not having that in place, I really felt like it was going to set, um, set the chief up for failure. And quite frankly, that I just really couldn't go on board with that. So it really was me sticking to my convictions about you have to draw a line somewhere. Uh, and uh, the thought of you know, uh, reducing the, the uh, police force by 50%, not having a plan in place for how you're going to provide legitimate uh, public safety, uh, just I couldn't stick around for that. Okay. Uh, you, you may have answered my, that, my next question, but do you feel that uh, there has been any positive result that has, that has come out of your decision to resign, recognizing the motivations for your decision to do so? Well, if nothing else, it certainly uh, brought some attention to what uh, to and to people that were in the discussion. I think that um, maybe people weren't paying as close of attention, but clearly, uh, you know, the, my resignation and um, you know all that went along with it uh, made people pay a little more attention. I think to what was going on, uh, and so for that, I, I'm grateful. Uh, as uh, as our, um, our I think the minister who spoke earlier said, we also be, we also be grateful. There's always something to be grateful and thankful for. So I was very grateful that that caused people to pay more attention, gave us more of a national footprint. Uh, about what was happening here in Seattle. So that part was good. I would hope 
um, that they're able to come up with a plan moving forward that's comprehensive, that really helps uh, all of our communities uh, to be better served by policing. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chief Best. I think all of us need conversations like this um, with police and all other kinds of aspects as we move forward, because I think um, um, Chief Best really sum summarized it best saying this was kind of a tumultuous year, or as Confucius says, may you live in interesting times. <laughs> so thank you very much. And in your um, name, uh, Chief Best, we will be giving, and what we'll be doing this year for every speaker is we'll be giving a book that will be go either to the Henry Beauchamp Center or to the Washington Fruit Community Center that is has something to do with the speaker and with some of the issues that we're facing as a society. This book is for middle and high schoolers and it's a book called Ghost Boys and it's about a young man and his interaction with the police in his community and um, with his family and how he uh, and the family deals with that. So I think that's one of the things we'll be doing this year with, uh, with our uh, speaker gifts. So thank you very much again, Chief Best. Great, thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you, mm -hmm. Before we adjourn, just a couple quick announcements. One is, you may have heard about the Rotary Playground that's happening out at the Greenway. This is the uh, last uh, few days of construction, and I know they would appreciate anybody who has, who has the time on Friday and Saturday to get out there and to, to help finish it up. It really looks amazing. It really does, despite what I looked like in that picture. The playground looks really great. So anyway, and uh, with that, there will be a thank you for donors next uh, Wednesday, or I'm just, sorry, not next Wednesday, but July 28th. Uh, in the evening, there will be a, um, um, a uh, um, reception and a um, bit of a party out there, kind of celebrating it. And the formal ribbon cutting will be at 10 a.m. on Thursday, July 29th. So you might want to mark your calendars for that. Also on J July 29th will be the, that evening is another opportunity for us to support Imagine Scholar. And uh, for those of you that haven't heard about that, there will be an event that night. Um, to um, and with Lucky, who was here last week, and to um, to again support that very important program in South Africa, and because some of you may know that I have something to do with lo have interest in local history, I thought I'd tell you that as we close this meeting today, and it's the time for travel, and everybody wants to get back to travel. In July of 1921, exactly 100 years ago. A fruit grower here by the name of Henry Lintz. Um, I don't know if any of you knew him or not, but uh, I doubt it. But he took the whole family back to see his family in Fargo, North Dakota. And the year before, they had gone by train. It cost $240. This year, they decided to go by car. And the entire trip cost them $95, with only $26.45 for gasoline. But the important thing is that he comments on the way back one thing noticed on this trip was that no one in eastern Washington seems eager to give information about a direct road to Yakima. We asked at Spokane, and we asked at Harrington, and no one told us about the road by way of the Vantage Ferry and Kittitas. I do not see why every section of the state of Washington seems to get aid for good road building from the state except Yakima County. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> so anyway, we are adjourned. Mm-hmm. <laughs>